Jack Chick talked a lot about the Jesuits and the Jesuit order. He worked with Edmund Paris and his wife, so Chick could publish an English translation of his French book, The Secret History of the Jesuits. It was only because of Jack that I really got into investigating the Jesuits. But the first thing I realized was this. Jesuits are not what they appear to be. I learned a lot of information in a testimony by a young man who escaped from the Jesuits in 1824. Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. Maybe once a century, the Lord allows a person to expose the horror of Babylon in its various forms. A modern example is Alberto Rivera. An 1800s example is this young man, Jacopo Leone. Let me tell you his story. Jacopo Leone was a child prodigy. He had a special talent. In the early 1820s, he had invented a form of shorthand. He liked to daydream in class, but he could be called upon at any moment. So he quickly wrote down in abbreviated form every word his teacher said. Then, when he caught him daydreaming or reading another book and told him to recite what was just said, he could recite it word for word. Frustrating, but brilliant. The problem was, even in the 1820s, schools more existed to squash creativity than to encourage it. There's only one exception to this rule that Jacobo knew of, the Jesuits. So, 19-year-old Jacobo finished his studies at the seminary of Vercelli. Then he spent some time with Luigi Guarelli, archpriest of Langosco, halfway between Turin and Milan in northern Italy. Luigi recommended that he try to gain admittance into the Jesuit order. According to Luigi, quote, none were admitted but as such as were distinguished for intellect, wealth, or station. That inflated his ego. So he wrote to Jan Philip Rotan, S.J., a Dutch priest who is rector of a Jesuit college in Turin. Jacobo saw the Jesuits as the most noble of the orders. Rotan recommended Jacobo to take the preliminary exams. In September of 1824, he was met by Rotan at the House of First Probation, where all applicants are probed to see if they are worthy to become Jesuits. Jacobo had never been treated more kindly. Rotan talked with him as if he was his closest friend and confidant. Of course, that was the way it was supposed to feel. Quote, It would be difficult for me to convey the, an idea of the consummate art employed to sound a conscience, to descend into the very depths of the inmost heart, and to make all its chords resound, the individual remaining all the while unconscious of the analysis which is going on. So occupied is he by the pleasant flow of the conversation, so beguiled by the air of frank good nature with which the artful process is conducted. In other words, Jacobo was being psychoanalyzed before the days of Freud. Just like Alberto said, which you'll see in a few minutes. But Rotan had a larger purpose. Rotan wanted to make sure that Jacobo desired to be a Jesuit more than anything else in the world, and that he was already willing to submit everything to the Jesuit order. And what Rotan wanted was more than Jacobo's testimony. This form of questioning is described right here in the Constitutions of the Jesuit Order. But that's another museum. Jacobo was approved and proceeded to the Jesuit monastery at Chieri, Turin, Italy. He described what happened next. Quote, On my arrival, they placed in my hands the rules which related to the first phases of my new existence. I was immediately initiated into the exercises of St. Ignatius and of other saints, all Jesuits. 
It is by this sudden and complete immersion of the soul that they acquire their unlimited power over so many young men, unarmed by experience and totally without defense. What Jacobo did next was sit in silence with the windows shuttered while his guardian angel, the father over each novice, lectured him on the Jesuit views of sin, the world, and eternal punishment. They told Jacopo that those who don't absolutely submit to the rules of Ignatius of Loyola are, quote, as an army of rebels, angels of darkness, whom Satan inspires and governs, and against whom battle must be waged, until the day of final victory by the army of the faithful, led on by those angels of light and chiefs of the sacred militia, the Jesuits. As for the enemy's camp, he spoke of nothing in it but its reeking pestilence and corruption." End quote. This, plus other exercises, were designed for one purpose, to break down the novice until, quote, each individual who has been wrought upon during a sufficient time comes at last to consider himself religiously bound to the total surrender of his own will, end quote. And it worked. In Jacobo's own words, quote, For I truly believe that the more I should identify myself with a society, the more I should belong to God. And in this deadening of every feeling which might stand in the way of my entire dedication to the order, I perceive nothing but a just and reasonable consequence of its directing principle, that the fewer ties we have with all that might distract us from our purpose, the more will be our power to persuade others to acknowledge that authority which it is the mission of the Jesuits to proclaim as the only one upon earth which is not subject to error. End quote. Jacopo was overwhelmed at times with the loss of all things that he held dear. Yet never once did he think of renouncing the society. When Jack Chick was arranging the funeral for his daughter Carol back in 2001, one of the men there asked for the Alberto comic series. He told Jack that he'd actually taken the first year of Jesuit training. He said they were tested over and over, and each time more candidates were eliminated. Finally, at the end of the year, there were a number of people standing. The Jesuit teacher then said, Those of you who are willing to submit your entire will to the Jesuit order may stay. The rest of you are dismissed. He couldn't go that far. So that was the end of his Jesuit training. So this isn't some ancient story. It's still taking place today. Back to Jacobo. Over the days, his the solitude and gloomy subjects of discussion broke down both his spirit and his health. The Jesuits offered him a kind of thick wine that left him feeling kind of sluggish. He tried to fast, but they kindly insisted he take nourishment. They told him the greatest saints in the order had gone through the same thing and done amazing achievements for God. For days, he sat in solitude on his knees, reading monks' books and meditations while he thought about the beautiful weather outside. One day, he could take it no longer. Jacopo wrote, quote, Being tempted by the fine autumn weather to breathe the fresh air and enjoy the sunshine, I begged my guardian angel to ask permission for me of the rector to walk for a few moments alone in the garden. You have only, he replied, to go to him and ask this permission for yourself. You may be certain he'll grant you whatever favor is in his power. Two days later, on an especially beautiful autumn day, Jacopo resolved to do just that. Quote, it was in the afternoon. I quitted my chamber and went to the rector's apartment, the door of which I found open. Although the rector was absent, this circumstance surprised me not a little, as among the Jesuits, everything is conducted with the most exact regularity. This rector was so informal and so personal that Jacobo decided to do what he would never do. He entered the apartment. 
that's where he found out what the Jesuits were really about. As far as Jacobo was concerned, he'd entered the abode of angels. When he saw the apartment lined with books, he believed they'd only be the finest writings obtainable anywhere. So, since no one is around to tell him no, and he was truly tired of reading the exercises all day long, he started looking at the books. He figured at any moment the rector would return, and Jacobo could present his request to go outside. That's why he didn't hesitate for a moment to take down a book to look at it. Quote, I raised my hand to a shelf of the library and joyfully seized a volume. To my surprise, I perceived a second row of books behind the first. Curiosity impelled me to take down the volume which had been concealed by the first I laid hold of. The name of the author has escaped my recollection, but it was, I think, a philosopher of the last century. I should have looked at it more deliberately had not a third row of books behind the second struck me by the peculiar style of the binding. What was my astonishment was when this title met my gaze, Confessions of the Novices. The side edges of the book were marked with the letters of the alphabet. Could I do less than to seek for the initial of my own name? Which he did. Quote, The first pages, written probably a few days after my arrival, contained a rough sketch of my character. I was utterly confounded. I recognized my successive confessions, each condensed to a few lines. So clear and accurate was the appreciation given of my temperament, my faculties, my affections, my weaknesses, and my strength, that I saw before my eyes a complete revelation of my own nature. What surprised me above all was the conciseness and energy of the expressions employed to sum up the characteristics of my whole being. The favorite images I found in this depository of outpourings of all sorts from the heart of ingenuous youth, were borrowed from the materials used in building. Hard, fragile, malleable, coarse, precious, necessary, accessory, a sort of figurative language, which had kept fast hold of my memory. I only regret that I could but glance with the rapidity of lightning over the pages that concerned myself. Yet this glance sufficed to reveal to me the object of such a work. An idea may be formed of it, from the passage I am about to cite, and of which I have retained an indelible remembrance. Quote, the amount, enthusiasm, and imagination with which he is endowed, said the text, might in time be made very useful in varnishing our work. His want of taste for the grotesque in religion will do no harm, but it proves that his talent must be employed in recommending and exalting to the more delicate consciences all that is pure and ennobling in religion. He'd spoil all if we were to let him work on the clumsier part of the edifice, whilst he will greatly aid its advancement if he's employed exclusively in the more delicate parts. Let him be kept, therefore, in the upper regions of thought, and let him not even be aware of the springs which set in movement, movement the vulgar part of the religious world. It is important that he should always have near him, in his moments of depression, someone to cheer him with brilliant anticipations. But should his ardor, on the contrary, lead him too far, some discouragement or disappointment must be prepared for him in order to mortify him and keep him in subjection." End quote. He continues, Not an atom of what I had as a matter of conscience revealed to my guardian angel or confessor was omitted in this register. When I recollect what sweeping inductions were drawn from the trifles which I consider myself bound to communicate, I cannot wonder that such a system, so based on profound study of character, pursued with so much assiduity and constancy, and applied on so vast a scale to individuals of every age and every condition, should place in the hands of the Jesuits an almost infallible means for attaining the end to which they have proposed themselves with such extraordinary determination. 
end quote. Jacobo started to think back over the statements he had heard over his lifetime about the sinister nature of the Jesuit order. Never had he thought they could be true until now. Even his doubts about the so-called miracle stories told him had been related to the rector. He was an open book, and his personality was set down in this open book. Jacobo was so intrigued. He grabbed another book that caught his eye called The Confessions of of strangers. And here was Jacobo's first major discovery. Quote, I hastily read over a few lines here and there, and the small portions that I read induced me afterwards to believe that everything in this order is done conformably to the rules of that little code known by the name of Manita Secreta, or secret instructions. It was, in fact, a collection of notes upon the persons of every class, of every age, rich men, bachelors, etc. Here again were circumstantial details, propensities, fortune, family, relations, vices, and virtues, together with such anecdotes as were calculated to characterize the personages. It is only in cases of exception, as I have since learned, that a Jesuit remains long in the same place. If he be allowed to continue his sojourn there, it is only when the superiors are convinced of the incontestable utility of the influence which he exercises. Whenever a Jesuit, particularly one of moderate abilities, has used up the resources of his mind in any particular place, and when he seems to have nothing new to produce, the regulations of the order require that he should be placed by another, who may in his turn be remarked and admired for a longer or shorter time. In these frequent changes, there's another advantage. The newcomer, entering upon the sacred office of his predecessor, as soon as he's learned the names of the persons who choose him for the director of their conscience, can, by means of the register of confessions, furnish himself in a few hours with all the experience acquired by his colleagues. This artifice endows him with the infallible power of surprising, confounding, and subjugating the penitents who kneel beside him. He penetrates them most unexpectedly, and, in a manner unprecedented, introduces himself into the most hidden folds of their hearts. It cannot be told with how much art the Jesuits profit by the astonishment they thus excite, and how adroitly they turn it to the advancement of their work. Thus I have met with rich bigots, old men, and often with young persons of the weaker sex who boldly maintain that the greater number of these reverend fathers are actually endowed with the spirit of prophecy. End quote. The Jesuits weren't just psychoanalyzing him. They were doing this with every single person they met, putting it into code in books like these. In a future video, I'll tell you another story about a Jesuit who showed these things to a Dominican priest. Think about what can happen now with the advent of computers and the Internet. When Alberto said the Vatican had a database on everyone, he wasn't just making it up. Even in the 1800s, and probably back to the 1500s, this was going on on paper and in code. Jesuits are not what they appear to be. All the time they are analyzing people to their very core to see how they can use them for their purposes. I need to stop here, but in the next video we'll find out the second discovery that Jacobo made when the Jesuit leaders, including the future Jesuit general, return to the room and discuss their plans for the world. Until then, God bless you, and have a wonderful day.